previous programmes, we've looked at lots of little bits of Shakespeare's text. We're going to look this evening at a longer passage, one that's virtually a whole scene by itself. We're going to work on it as if we were actually rehearsing the play. Lots of the points we've talked about will come up because I particularly want to dig into the scene for its textual richness and the verse. Of course, if we were rehearsing the play for full, there'd be lots of rehearsals where the text wasn't talked about and much more time would be spent on the relationship of the characters and the staging. But I want to stick here to the basic theme of playing Shakespeare. What hints and help are there in Shakespeare's text, and particularly in his verse, for the actors to seize upon and to use? Here's a scene from Twelfth Night between Orsino and Vala. She's disguised as a boy, and she's in love with him, but he doesn't know this. She's acting as his servant and messenger. So let's start the scene off from the top. Give me some music. Now, good morrow, friends. Now, good Cesario. But that piece of song, that old and antique song we heard last night, I thought it did relieve my passion much. Come, but one verse. He is not here, so please your lordship, that should sing it. Who was it? Festy the jester, my lord. A fool that the lady Olivia's father took much delight in. Here's a bite the house. Seek him out, and play the tune the while. <clears throat> okay. Now, that beginning is pretty straightforward, and we don't need to stop on it very long. Mm -hmm. Just want to point out one thing about the verse. We've said how Shakespeare gets extra stress by stressing an offbeat word in the verse line, like going dum dum instead of de dum. Mm -hmm. And you, to kick the scene off, have two or three of those. You mm -hmm. say, "Give me some music," mm -hmm. which picks up the scene and launches you into the scene, yeah. which wants to go further, I think. And then the next line, "Now, good Cesario," so you're starting something, and come, but one verse. Those three extra stresses at the beginning mm -hmm. suggests your eagerness and excitement at the beginning of the scene. You're going to go more mellow later. And there's one textual hint about the ruminative nature of Orsino, which is that old and antique song. You love and indulge old, ancient and antique songs. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back on that. From the top. Yeah. <clears throat> Give me some music. Now, good morrow, friends. Now, good Cesario. But that piece of song. An old and antique song we heard last night. We thought it did relieve my passion much. Come, but one verse. He is not here, so please your lordship, that should sing it. Who was it? Festy, the jester, my lord, a fool that the lady Olivia's father took much delight in. He is about the house. Seek him out and play the tune the while. I'm saying that in, presumably to some musicians. Yes. That we, we may got, or may not have. Right? We've got music. <coughs> where are they? Yes, because yes. I'm I'm looking over there. You're the music. <laughs> I think they're over there. That's oh, where right. your musicians are. <laughs> yeah. Over that way. Right. Now, uh, before before we go on to the next bit, let me just I don't want to stop too long on this bit either, but let me just point out one or two things in the verse in the next speech. The business of extra stress again in Shakespeare. Mm. In the second line, in the sweet pangs, did he dum dum. That sweet is in an offbeat contrapuntal position and has extra stress because of it. Mm -hmm. And of course, the balance between sweet and pangs Thanks. need bringing out because that's what Orsino is. It is sweet to him and he is in pain, but he loves it. And in love with love, right? Love with, in love with love. Yes. And then at the end of the speech, you have a very simple monosyllabic sentence. How dost thou like this tune? Well, if you say it just casually, like I've just said it, it's, it's a nothing. But if you give 
each of the words are stressed, as you always should with a monosyllabic line of Shakespeare's, it'll take you into the depth of your love for music and into your love melody. So how dost yes. thou like yes. this? Each word matters. Yes. Okay? Yes. So, you've gone. On we go again. Come here, boy. Whoever thou shalt love, in the sweet pangs of it, remember me. For such as I am, all true lovers are. Unstayed and skittish in all motions else, save in the constant image of the creature that is beloved. How dost thou like this tune? It gives a very echo to the seat where love is thrown. Good. Now maybe we could indulge the love melancholy even more in that, that you could go even further with the sweet pangs, yes. even further with how do you yes. like the tune. And also, when you say, for such as I am, all true lovers are, you slightly took that naturalistically. Just think of those words, for such as I am, all true lovers are. I am the best lover in the world. There is self-love with your own love in that, isn't there? Yes. Let's do it once again and yes. indulge more. Mm -hmm. Come here, the boy. If ever thou shalt love, in the sweet pangs of it, remember me. For such as I am, all true lovers are. Unstayed and skittish in all motions else, save in the constant image of the creature that is beloved. How dost thou like this tune? It gives a very echo to the seat where love is throned. Thou dost speak masterly. <laughs> I like upon And for spoken masterly, very good. <laughs> but we've come now towards, I think, the next textual verse question in the scene, mm. which is, what do you do about the verse when a new sentence or a new speech begins at the half line? Mm -hmm. It's the thing of doing the detective work and deciding whether, because the verse line shared between the two of you, the cue is picked up immediately, or whether there's a pause. Now, this scene is very rich in choices that way, because sometimes it says, pick up the cue, but sometimes, because Shakespeare's done a short verse line, he says there's a pause somewhere. So we've got to look for those as well. And there's a number of them coming up in the next few lines. So let's pick it up from, it gives a very echo to the seat again, and I would suggest that where love is thrown, thou dost speak masterly, is one verse line. And you pick it up at once because you're getting in tune with her. So probably that one isn't a pause. What do you think? Well, the only thing that is for, it's for the, um, the fact that she is speaking masterly. It's for the fact that, for that to register, isn't it, John? I mean, he listens. When you hear something spoken so beautifully as that, I mean, suddenly this boy comes up with this extraordinary remark. Well, it's riveting, isn't it? As always, I say Whereas that I, when these things are raised, they're only questions and we have choices. But I'd suggest that maybe you do take up the verse line there at once and that the pause comes after it. The so very it's seat where love is thrown, thou dost speak. That's wonderful. Pause. The pause goes with the verse. It goes with, after speak, does it? Speak no. masterly. Well, it's after masterly. At the end of the verse line. Yes. Uh-huh. I mean, as always, one has to raise these questions, but as always decide which is best. Yes. You don't have to follow the rule, but very often Shakespeare's right. Yes. yes. So pick it up from it gives a very echo. How does, how does thou like this? It gives a very echo to the seat where love is thrown. Thou dost speak masterly. <laughs> My life upon, young though thou art, thine eye hath stayed upon some favour that it loves. Hath it not, boy? A little, by your favour. What kind of woman is't? Of your complexion. She is not worth thee, then. But there's another one there, isn't there? Of your complexion, yeah. she is not worth thee, then. Yeah, exactly. Can you make your own choice about it? Then? Yes, I think you've got to be aware that these things are happening in the text and then make your choice. Mm. We've got two or three all together. Yes. Hath it not, boy, a little by your favour, is one verse line. And you did, in fact, pick it up then, which I thought was yes. right. And I thought, by the way, that pausing off to thou to speak masterly it actually works, works, yeah, works it better. Does work, yeah. Then there's another one when Orsino says, what kind of woman is, and you say, of your complexion. 
Yes. So maybe you don't pause there. Yes. That's the question to raise. Yes. And then the other thing happens. The senior but, says, she is not worthy then what years it faith, and you have a short verse line which only has about your yes, years, my, my lord. lord. Well, Shakespeare's built a pause there because there's a short line in missing beats. So what we have to decide is whether to pause before or after the line in such cases. So which do you I, think might be right there? I would imagine that it should be before yeah. because it's such a wonderful mm. payoff for that's Orsino right. to say too old by heaven. Well, I think that's mm. the point because what Shakespeare usually does with all this system is to earn the pauses for the actors. Mm. You see, if you pick up these half-line cues as they're written, mm. when a pause comes, it's the stronger. Yeah. But if you make lots of little individual pauses, then it all goes naturalistic and the verse drive and rhythm of Shakespeare disappears. So try it again from... Can I just just be quite sure yeah. that I've got the, the actual lines? Hath it not, boy, a little by your favour, end of line. End correct? of line. What kind of woman is of, of your, your complexion? complexion? End, of, end line. of line. She is not worth thee then what years, if faith? End of line. About your years, my lord. Too old by heaven. That's the pause. End of line. Because that's after, a very important heaven, moment for Vala. Yes. Because she doesn't quite know what to say to you. Let's yes. just run that section then. Yes. From... Uh, Gives a very echo again. How does that like this tune? It gives a very echo to the seat where love is throned. Thou dost speak masterly. <laughs> My life upon, young though thou art, thine eye hath stayed upon some favour that it loves. Hath it not, boy? A little by your favour. What kind of woman is it? Of your complexion. She is not worthy then. What <gasps> years, if faith? About your years, my lord. Too old, by heaven. Now, but still, the how, woman. How, how do we think that works? I was. I, I think Does I let in. Time? I, I did, not quite. I didn't. Didn't quite. I quite gave time on one of them. Mm. She's not worth thee then. I don't think I gave time for that. I feel I want to pause before of the, of your complexion, it because is... she's caught caught out, isn't she? A bit. There's always yeah. another option about a pause: is that you can always have it within the words, can't you? So, of your complexion, you could pick up the cue, but say, um, you could feel for it with the words themselves. Oh, lovely, yes, yes. Then you follow okay. Shakespeare's rhythm, but you yes. have your pause. Yes. I mean, always the question about a pause is, does it come before the line, does it come after the line, or can it come in the middle mm -hmm. of the line? Or have you earned it? Or have you earned yes. it? That's the most important point. But we earned the last one there. Let's, let's go on to the next bit. So, Pick it up from what years, if faith? Um, what years, if faith? About your years, my lord. Too old, by heaven. Let still the woman take an elder than herself. So where she to him? So sway she level in her husband's heart. For boy, however we do praise ourselves, our fancies are more giddy and unfirm, more longing, wavering, sooner lost and worn than women's are. I think it well, my lord. And let thy love be younger than thyself. For thy affections cannot hold the bent. Cannot hold the bent means cannot... Uh, last. Last. Isn't it? Can't endure. Yes, yes. Now that seemed all perfectly straightforward. Yes, it? the verse there is much more straightforward, except there's the little indication that his thoughts are teeming because a sentence begins halfway through the verse line, which is very often a, a hint in Shakespeare to the actor that the thoughts are tumbling out of him. Too old by heaven, let still the woman take. It's good to run that line on because his mind is teeming. I think the only thing maybe we missed was that there's a bigger gear change for Orsino halfway through that speech after he said so sway she level in her husband's heart. For boy, however we do praise ourselves, our fancies are more giddy and unfirm, and you make an admission about yourself, and you tell the truth about your own self-indulgence yes. as a lover. It's blokes talk, isn't it, really? Yeah. It's, it's That's right. chat between fellows. But if you took the first three lines of that speech, pouring out of you quite fluently, and then, yes. Yes. for boy, however we do praise ourselves, you slowed up and began to look at yourself sardonically. 
Even I Riley, John. Even Riley. Even Riley. Yeah. What years are faith? What years are faith? About your years, my lord. Too old, by heaven. Let still the woman take an elder than herself. So wears she to him, so sways she level in her husband's heart. For boy, however we do praise ourselves, our fancies are more giddy and unfirm, or longing, wavering, sooner lost and worn than women's are. I think it well, my lord. And let thy love be younger than thyself, for thy affections cannot hold the bent. For women are as roses, whose fair flower, being once displayed, doth fall that very hour. And so they are. Alas, that they are so. To die even when they to perfection grow. Okay, could hold it a moment. We'll have a couple of points on that bit, I think. Um, as being a bit self-indulgent there, perhaps, at the expense of the, of the rhythm. Was I? Or did I, had no, I earned I think, it? I think you've earned it. <laughs> Let me raise another verbal point, which is the importance often in verbs. We're good at colouring coloured nouns and adjectives, but sometimes the verbs are the active words in a line. For instance, you said, so where she to him. But surely it's, so where she to him. So yes. sway she level in her yeah. husband's heart. That's a good example of a sentence where the yeah. verbs are the important ones. Yeah. And then another point which comes up at the end of that little bit, which is we've run into a couple of couplets, haven't we? A couple of rhyming couplets. Orsino has one and Bala has one. Mm. Now, we've usually given ourselves the rule that if we have a couplet, the speaker knows that it's a couplet and makes it a couplet because they want a couplet or need a couplet. Mm -hmm. And you've got to set up a couplet <coughs> for her to answer you with a couplet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that coining of a couplet is part of your self-dramatization and self-indulgence. Mm -hmm. And her couplet brings it down to earth again. But you need to set up yours for hers to pay off. So just take it from let thy affection be younger than thyself, yeah. then. <clears throat> then let thy love be younger than thyself, or thy affections cannot hold the bent. For women are as roses, whose fair flower, being once displayed, doth fall that very hour. And so they are, alas, that they are so, to die even when they to perfection grow. And what, just pause a moment and say what you think about what you should do about couplets and the, are they a problem or are they good stuff or what? Musically, it's lovely that this little passage between them ends like that. It's just like it ends on, on a, not a major note, but it just ends, the two, the two couplets just end the scene before the next. That's right. I reckon, the next bit. I reckon if you give full weight to those mm. couplets, mm. you do round off the scene and you then earn a pause before Bestie and Curio come back. Mm. And I think I should have been a bit jerky but if, earlier on. But it seems to me there's, for both of you, there is more element of humour about oneself in the situation. You, the humour of being dressed as a boy yes. and wry. Yes. Mm. And you are able, however indulgent you are, mm. to mock yourself as a lover. Mm. Mm. And when you would make the admission to the boy that your fancies are wavering and inconstant, but it's a very sad, this is a and very sad reflection. I was going to say, couplet, I just think it? that last couplet of mine, for instance, is not, is it? That's when she, it's a like a volte face. That's it's right. It's when yeah. she actually... Which almost perhaps she takes off him because yes. his couplet, I mean, it's very, it's a sad reflection, isn't it? Why don't we try taking it from too old by heaven? And that's got humour mm. and self-mockery mm. in it, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. And for boy, however we do praise ourselves, that's wry humour against yourself. Our fancies are more giddy and unfirm. I know I'm giddy and unfirm. And uh, when you say women are as roses whose fair flower being once displayed at all that very hour, maybe that's at that point a bit callous about women, a bit sexist perhaps. It seems to me if you go mellow and melancholy on that, then her lines don't break into your lines. Yes. If you say, yes. women, they don't last, and she says, yeah. 
That's true, that's true, and breaks into it. Yes. 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 So, do it again from, what year is your faith again? What year is your faith? About your years, my lord. Too old, by heaven. Let still the woman take an elder than herself. So wears she to him, so sways she level in her husband's heart. For boy, however we do praise ourselves, our fancies are more giddy and unfirm, more longing, wavering, sooner lost and worn than women's are. I think it well, my lord. And let thy love be younger than thyself, or thy affections cannot hold the bent. <laughs> the women are as roses, whose fair flower, being once displayed, doth fall that very hour. And so they are. Alas, that they are so. To die even when they to perfection grow. Now, what's coming there, I thought, was very good, was that the text is beginning to work on itself. Words qualify words. One sentence qualifies another. Her speech at the end breaks into yours. So that the mood is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. It's about the inconstancy and shiftingness of mood in love, the scene, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So the text itself and the verse has to shift. If uh, you play it too evenly, we get, as always in Shakespeare, a generalized mood and it doesn't work. But if you play all the contrasts as they come, then there's riches and riches for the audience to latch on. Mm -hmm. It was very good. <clears throat> oh, fellow, come. The song we had last night, the market society. It is old and plain, the spinners and the knitters in the sun, and the free maids that weave their thread with bones, do used to chant it. It is silly sooth, dallies with the innocence of love, like the old age. Are you ready, sir? Aye, right, pretty, sing. Okay, don't sing for a moment. <laughs> Two points to come out of that, I think. Um, okay. There's a wonderful example of a resonant monosyllabic line here. The spinners and the knitters in the sun and the free maids that weave their thread with bones. Mm. If you let that line breathe, if you stretch the words, it has extraordinary poetic resonance. Mm. If you just say it naturalistically and the free maids <laughs> works, and indeed as I often point out, if you try and take a monosyllabic line fast, you get into a tongue twister and it doesn't work anyway. But I thought that the free maids that weave their thread with bones, that you could find the textual richness, richness of that by envying them their innocence and their happiness. Because you say in the speech, the song dallies with the innocence of love, mm. which I haven't got. I'm sophisticated in love, I or Sino. I'm love-worn, I'm love-sophisticated, I wish I had the innocence. Mm -hmm. And then there's another smashing example of a Shakespeare pause built into the text, isn't there, at the end of Orsino's speech, because he says, and Dallas, with the innocence of love, like the old age. Pause for me to decide whether he's finished. Or not. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Is it all right to start? That's yes. right. Are you ready, sir? At last. It's quite funny. Yeah. If there's a pause. I mean, yes. Shakespeare's built a bit of comedy into his pause yes. there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let me just say one thing about the song. Very famous lyric. The the nature of the song, of course, is described by Orsino itself. It is old and plain and country people sing it, and it's about the innocence of love. So that tells us what the song smells like, but it also tells us what you think is in the song. Mm -hmm. But what does Festi think is in the song? Quite a long song, and there's also the fact that there are two verses of it. There's always a danger with a song on the stage, isn't there, that a verse repeats itself, so the action gets becalmed because yeah. the tune repeats. And I've always felt that there was something different in these two verses, that maybe in the first verse, Festy sings it straight. And then he starts to mock him in the second. Yes. yes. And in yes. the second one, he starts to actually send up Orsino exactly. for his love indulgence. Exactly. Yeah. So, should we try it that way and yeah. mock him up in any way? It'll all come like. out the same, but I'll let that be the intention. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully the tune... You know the tune? Yeah. <laughs> we hope the tune will be the same. Yeah. But be as outrageous as you can with that... Uh, oh, the sending verse. of him up, yes. yes. 
And we thought it might be quite a good idea if I moved onto the floor here, wouldn't it? So it would give Norman All right. a bit of chance to but use this. Yes, because if he's the away from me, then it gives yeah. me a yes. chance to mock him behind his back. That's, that's right. And yes. perhaps play some of it off. off Absolutely. Behind. She can see that you're mocking yes. him, yes. but he mustn't, I think. So, again... Okay. Just for Old Fellow yeah. Come. Yeah, Old Fellow Come. Old Fellow Come, the song we had last night, Markets is on It is old and plain. The spinners and the knitters in the sun... And the free maids that weave their thread with bones do used to chant it. It is silly sooth and dallies with the innocence of love. Like the old age. Are you ready, sir? Aye, for thee. Sing. Come away, come away, death, and in sad Cyprus let me be laid. Fly away, fly away, breath, I am slain by a fair cruel maid. My shroud of white stuck all with you, oh prepare it, my part of death. No one so true did share it. Not a flower, not a flower sweet. On my black coffin let there be strown. Not a friend, not a friend greet my poor corpse where my bones shall be thrown. A thousand thousand sighs to save lay me oh where sad true lover ne'er find my grave to weep there well good a word about songs. I, I always think they're a terrible trap in a Shakespeare scene because one can so easily have an exquisite song but the action and the play becomes becalmed. No danger of that in this case. No, no, no. <laughs> but no, my, my point is that truly looked into over and over a song, which we've not talked about in this series, but a, a Shakespeare song or a piece of music actually becomes part of the action of the scene. And I've seen this scene done very often where there's pause for lovely song, but it seems totally extrinsic to the scene. So what does the song do here? Presumably, as it's his favourite song, he plays it to feed his love melancholy, and the song makes the disease worse. So it's tear time for all scenery, really, isn't it? Well... Almost. It's going to lead him to breaking out in a minute, perhaps. Yes. I mean, he's been worked up and inside it and something's going to snap in a minute he'd say go back and see olivia which is yes. the beginning of the last section with yes. vala yes. but i th i thought watching it that it was as important to see the song working on you as to hear the song sung by norman yes because the the, the, the scene is about your melancholy yes so let's pick it up from the end of the song then we get a prose bit which goes on up to Bestie's exit, which is reasonably straightforward. So, from end of song. There's for thy pains. There are no pains, sir. I take pleasure in singing, sir. I'll pay thy pleasure, then. Truly, sir, and pleasure will be paid, one time or another. Give me now leave to leave thee. Now the melancholy God protect thee, for thy mind is a very opal. I would have men of such constancy put to sea, that their business might be everything and their intent everywhere. For that's it, that always makes a good voyage of nothing. Farewell. Okay. Now, <coughs> though there's nothing particularly complex textually in that, I think dramatically and character-wise one needs to say something, because you played rightly the professional fool, but I think it's actually a bit more loaded than you made it. I think there's a bit more subtext that we could find out of it. For instance, when you say pleasure will be paid one time or another, that's something you've learnt out of life. Maybe you're trying to teach him a lesson, 
but within the general flipness, the suddenly, as so often with Shakespeare's fool, a very serious remark. And uh, when you say the melancholy God protect thee, for thy mind is very opal, the melancholy God, the God he worships, the God of love melancholy. So it's more getting inside him. Yes. And surely the payoff word for so that's it that makes a good voyage of nothing. nothing. Your love, your indulgence is nothing. So, which builds the fires for Orsino. Which builds the fires yes. for Orsino. Yeah. And put to sea, it, um, put to sea is to, to be as inconstant as the waves and winds. Yes. yes, that's right. So that finally you're going to finish yeah. up whatever, whatever your business that's is. Right. Being healthy, you're going to finish up with nothing. That's right. Yes. But I, I've often seen the scenes down there with Festy Frolicsome. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's his public persona, and maybe he is frolicsome on the surface, but underneath it's a much darker bit. Yes. So do it again and try to right. disturb him more. <coughs> um, there's for thy pain. And no pain, sir. I take pleasure in singing, sir. I'll pay thy pleasure, then. Truly, sir. And pleasure will be paid, one time or another. Give me now leave to leave thee. Now the melancholy God protect thee, for thy mind is a very opal. I would have men of such constancy put to sea, that their business might be everything and their intent everywhere. For that's it that always makes a good voyage of nothing. Good. Farewell. And all the rest give place. Once more, Cesario, get thee to yon same sovereign cruelty. Tell her, my love, more noble than the world, prizes not quantity of dirty lands. The parts that fortune hath bestowed upon her, tell her, I hold as giddily as fortune. Okay, yes, just, just come back a moment. I thought that was great. I thought that put Orsino under a tremendous pressure. And what we must look at is how the the verse begins to work to help put you into orbit for the next section. Because you say, let all the rest give place once more, Cesario. Now, sometimes that editors print that as two lines, but I think it's one line. Mm. And I think that you shouldn't wait for the exit. The pressure's built up that he's put on you. And you say, right, everybody, get out. Go on, Cesario. And from this moment on in the scene, your impatience to reach out to Olivia drives you, and the tempo of the scene positively changes in the verse. I think that the scene runs on to up to her outburst of I bet I know. I think What dost thou know, yes. Well, what yes. dost thou know? That's jumping a little bit, but while we're mentioning it, and that I owe Olivia, I bet I know, is one verse line, and you say, what dost thou know, which is a short verse line. And by God, that earns a pause there. I suspect we'll find in a minute if anything does. Mm. But what I'd want to pick up where we've got to, when you say once more, Cesario, you have a little speech where, same point as we made at the very beginning of the scene, yeah. the contrapuntal stress, the extra stress, is at the beginning of the verse line, which always gives an extra bite to what the speaker's saying. Get thee. Get thee. Tell her. Tell her I hold as giddily as fortune. So it's go, come on, something's got to happen. And the rhythm of you changes totally. So in fact, the festive scene has had the reverse effect to what he anticipated. He was sitting there. That's right. Yes. Listen to his melancholy yes. song and the, the effect it has on That's him. That's right. It's actually the complete opposite. Yes. That's right. I mean, I, what I would say that the festive encounter, which can so often be played just as interlude with clown and song, actually mm. has a great dramatic effect on the yeah. scene and on our scene. Mm. Mm. And it's probably painful to you as well, isn't it? Mm. The love songs. Yes. So let's, let's take it from Let All the Rest Give Place, mm. from the end of Festi. Mm -hmm. For that's it that always makes a good voyage of nothing. Farewell.
And all the rest give face once more, Cesario. Get thee to yon same sovereign cruelty. Tell her, my love, more noble than the world, prizes not quantity of dirty lands. The parts that fortune hath bestowed upon her, tell her, I hold as giddily as fortune. But if she cannot love you, I sir... I cannot be so answered. Sus, but you must. Uh, say that some lady, as perhaps there is, hath for your love as great a pang of heart as you have for Olivia. You cannot love her, you tell her so. Must she not then be answered? There is no woman's sides can bide the beating of so strong a passion as love doth give my heart. Make no compare between that love a woman can bear me and that I owe Olivia. Aye, but I know! Oh, what dost thou know? Okay, good. I think that the pressure continues between the two of them right up to what dost thou know? Yes. And I think that there is only one possible pause in that section, which is when Orsino again has a short verse line. There is no woman's sides. Now, what does that suggest to you? Viola says, must she not then be answered? Short verse line, there is no, no woman's, woman's sides. sides. Can I abide the beating of so strong a person? So look, it's all one, isn't it? It may be that there's a beat before there is no woman's sides because she's scored. She said something that stops you in your tracks for a moment. I suspect that's the one pause in the section. Yes. Can I put a pause, John, before say that some lady, it's as if she takes the decision to, um, to open a tiny door. Is that, po is that allowable? A pause always is allowable. When one has to ask oneself, is it justified? Mm. Yes. I I'm, I'm not against pauses. All I think I'm saying is that in our modern work, we put in pauses wherever we want them. And if you start doing that too much in Shakespeare, the text begins yes. to go wrong, yes. and you have to earn each one, yes. and you have to question whether it should be there or not. Yes. Get thee to yon same sovereign cruelty. Tell her, my love, more noble than the world, prizes not quantity of dirty lands. The parts that fortune hath bestowed upon her, tell her I hold as giddily as fortune. But if she cannot love you, sir... I cannot be so answered. Sus, but you must. Say that some lady, as perhaps there is, hath for your love as great a pang of heart as you have for Olivia. You cannot love her, you tell her so. Must she not then be answered? There's no woman's sides can bide the beating of so strong a passion as love doth give my heart. Make no compare between that love a woman can bear me, and that I owe... Olivia. Aye, but I know! What dost thou know? Too well what love women to men may owe. In faith they are as true of heart as we. My father had a daughter loved a man. As it might be perhaps were I a woman. I should your lordship. And what's her history? A blank, my lord. She never told her love. But let concealment, like a worm i' the bud, feed on her damask cheek. Okay, very good. Stop you there. I think that taking that with that sweep earned Judy's time on the moment we've yeah. got to. I thought that yeah. worked very well. Let me just make one point about where we've got to. Viola's talking about her love pain but she, the bit of her that sees the ridiculous side of it, the sad, funny side of it, maybe one needs to go a bit further yes. with that. Yes. I mean, the idea of sitting like patients on a monument always seems to me to be a funny idea in itself. Yes. <laughs> and if you have the pain, but you also can see the ridiculous side of the whole situation of you being dressed as a boy and having this conversation with the person you love. Yeah. Well, that's one little, um, one, two, four words. I don't quite know where to put the stress to on and what's her history. Is it, and um, what's her history? Well, tell me about her then, if you must. Is it, or yeah. what's her, <clears throat> is it, is history. it more interested? And what's, what's her, her history? history? Yeah. History is the strong what's the, word. What is the story of her? And I yeah. am quite interested. Yeah. It's I think not a dismissive. No, I think you're interested. Yes, Just I pick see. it up from there. And what's her history? What's her history? A blank, my lord. She never told her love. But let concealment like a worm i' the bud feed on her damask cheek. She pined in thought. And with a green and yellow melancholy, 
she sat like patience on the monument, smiling at grief. Was not this love indeed? We men may say more, swear more, but indeed our shows are more than will. For still we prove much in our vows, but little in our love. But died thy sister of her love, my boy? I am all the daughters of my father's house. And all the brothers, too. And yet, I know not. Sir, shall I to this lady? Aye, that's the theme to her in haste. Give her this jewel. Say, my love can give no place. By no delay. I thought you did the famous bit. Wonderful, mm. wonderful. I think, Maybe cry every night, yeah. oh, <laughs> I think the only point I want to make about the end is how the verse breaks the mood again at the end. I mean, you rightly snapped out of it. Shall I to this lady? He snapped out of it. Now, the verse picks up there at the half line, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Aye, that's the theme. No pause for you there. And you round the whole thing off with a vigorous couplet. End of scene, couplet, let's go. So you cut into her mood. Is there, is there the slightest sense that from Orsino that he is not what all that he pretends to be at this point in the play? That she, you mean? Yes. That... Yes. She, yes. he. I think you realize there's something very strange about the boy. Yes. Though you don't recognize it's not a boy. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is that moment. Yes, no. I mean, that you want the, that's why I pause, John, you see. Yeah. And is that pause justified there because of that thought? Yes, I think it's justified to... if you then brush it away and there's a change at the next beat. Hmm. Now, I think we must, uh, we must on now. And what I'd like to do now, having done it in little bits, is to just run the whole scene, see what we retain of that, and go for these violent, jagged gear changes within the yes. scene, and overdo the text, Dickie. Go too yep. far. Right. OK? Mm -hmm. So we do it from the top. All right, off we go. Give me some music. Now, good morrow, friends. Now, good Cesario. But that piece of song, that old and antique song we heard last night, I thought it did relieve my passion much. Come, but one verse. He is not here, so please your lordship that should sing it. Who was it? Feste the jester, my lord. A fool that the Lady Olivia's father took much delight in. He is about the house. Seek him out and play the tune the while. Come here, the boy. <clears throat> Ever thou shalt love in the sweet pangs of it, remember me. For such as I am, all true lovers are. Unstayed and skittish in all motions else, save in the constant image of the creature that is beloved. How dost thou like this tune? It gives a very echo to the seat where love is thrown. How dost speak masterly? <laughs> My life upon it. Young though thou art, thine eye has stayed upon some favour that it loves, hath it not, boy? A little, by your favour. What kind of woman is it? Of your complexion. She's not worthy, then. <laughs> what years, of faith? About your years, my lord. Too old, I hope. <laughs> Let still the woman take an elder than herself. So wears she to him, so sways she level in her husband's heart. For, boy, however we do praise ourselves, our fancies are more giddy and unfirm, more longing, wavering, Sooner lost and worn than women's are. I think it well, my lord. Mm. Then let thy love be younger than thyself, or thy affections cannot hold the bent. For women are as roses, whose fair flower being once displayed doth fall that very hour. And so they are. Alas, that they are so. To die even when they to perfection grow. Oh, fellow, come. 
The song we had last night. Mark it, Cesario. It is old and plain. The spinners and the knitters in the sun did used to sing it. And the free maids that weave their thread with bones did used to chant it. It is silly sooth. Dallies with the innocence of love. Like the old age. Are you ready, sir? Aye, really, sing. Come away, come away, death, and in sad Cyprus let me be laid. Fly away, fly away, breath. I am slain by a fair, cruel maid. My shroud of white stuck all with you. Oh, prepare it, my part of death. No one so true did share it. Not a flower, not a flower sweet. On my black coffin let there be strewn. Not a friend, not a friend greet my poor corpse where my bones shall be thrown. A thousand, thousand sighs to save. Lay me, oh, where? Sad true lover, ne'er find my grave to weep. There. There's for thy pains. Oh, no pains, sir. I take pleasure in singing, sir. I'll pay thy pleasure, then. Truly, sir. And pleasure will be paid. One time or another. Give me now leave to leave thee. Now the melancholy God protect thee, for thy mind is a very opal. I would have men of such constancy put to sea, that they are... I would have men of such constancy put to sea, that their business might be everything and their intent everywhere. For that's it, that always makes a good voyage of nothing. Farewell. And all the rest give place. Once more, Cesario, get thee to yon same sovereign cruelty. Tell her, my love, more noble than the world. Prize is not quantity of dirty lands. The, po the parts that fortune hath bestowed upon her, tell her I hold as giddily as fortune. But if she cannot love you, sir... I cannot be so answered. Yes, but you must. Say that some lady, as perhaps there is, hath for your love as great a pang of heart as you have for Olivia. You cannot love her, you tell her so. Must she not then be answered? There is no woman's sides can bide the beating of so strong a passion as love doth give my heart. Make no compare between that love a woman can bear me and that I owe oh, Olivia. Aye, but I know. Oh, what dost thou know? Too well what love women to men may owe. In faith, they are as true of heart as we. My father had a daughter loved a man. As it might be, perhaps, were I a woman, I should your lordship. What's her history? A blank, my lord. She never told her love. But let concealment, like a worm i' the bud, feed on her damask cheek. She pined in thought, and with a green and yellow melancholy, she sat like patience on the monument. Smiling at grief. Was not this love indeed? We men may say more, swear more, but indeed our shows are more than will. For still we prove much in our vows, but little in our love. Died thy sister of her love, my boy? I am all the daughters of my father's house. 
and all the brothers too. And yet, I know not. Sir, shall I to this lady? Aye, to her, in haste. That's the theme, to her, in haste. Give her this jewel. Say, my love can give no place. Bide, no deny. Look, but I, I think you did that beautifully. Give us mess, I'm in here. I think if I was to sum up, I would stress very strongly that what we've rehearsed together now is only one aspect of the business, isn't it? Because I've been laying down the law about the verse because I've been stressing how we must give our attention to it. I don't want to be thought of as saying that I'm issuing rules or that you have to follow the verse. What we're saying is that you have to be aware of the verse and you have to be aware of how it works and to find out how, you ha how it helps you. So what's the moral of the rehearsal? We've dug into the material, we've moved the scene on a bit in a particular way, but of course we haven't been trying to find a definitive solution, just one possibility. With Shakespeare there are always a limitless number of answers and different ones come up at each rehearsal. So what have we been trying to prove? Simply this, that the clues in the text are much richer and more numerous than at first appears. I suppose if I were to draw a moral from my rehearsal, it would be simply this, that though the possibilities are infinite, we can only sift the fruitful from the perverse by getting our teeth into the text and the verse itself. If the textual points are ignored, it's pretty certain that Shakespeare's intentions will be ignored or at least twisted. Something else will be put in their place, maybe valid in itself, but nonetheless a distortion. I'm not trying to knock that kind of work. It can be rich and exciting in its own right, but it is an alternative to, and not a realization of, Shakespeare. Shakespeare is his text, and the way he uses it is just that. So if you want to do him justice, you have to look for and follow the clues he offers. If an actor does that, then he'll find that Shakespeare himself starts to direct him. Thank you.